I ask, Lord, that you would fulfill that line that we've sung on all three campuses this weekend. Let every heart prepare him room. I'm praying it, Lord. I'm praying it. I'm not commanding it. I'm praying it. Because it's your work. If we prepare a place and you come, you have moved us to do that. Because we don't want you to come unless you are at work within us. And so I pray it. Let every heart within the sound of my voice feel a desire for the presence of the Lord of the universe and the Savior of the world. Forgiving and purifying and giving hope. So do a great regenerating work in these days. May Bethlehem experience an unusual outpouring as we turn from 2007 to 2008. Let it open a newness of spiritual vitality among us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Two times in that passage that was just read from 1 John 3, we are told why Christmas happens. Why the divine, eternal Son of God clothed himself with human being. Verse 5, John says, You know that he appeared to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. So he affirms the sinlessness of, of the incarnate Christ and he affirms why he appeared, namely to take away sins. And then verse 8, second half of the verse, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work, the works of the devil. And the specific focus he has in his mind when he says works of the devil is sin. You can see that in the first part of the verse. Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So the works of the devil that he came to destroy are primarily the works of sin. So two times in this text we're told why Jesus appeared, why Christmas was necessary to take away sin and to destroy the works of the devil which are sin. So he's born of a virgin. He increases in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. He's perfectly obedient and without sin, as verse 5 says. He perfectly dies in our place, mightily rises from the dead, all of it to take away sin and destroy the works of the devil. Now, we're in the middle of a series of messages on the new birth. And I'm asking the question in this just before Christmas message, what does the birth of Jesus have to do with our new birth? Or what does the incarnation have to do with regeneration? That's my question in this message. What is the, the coming of Christ into the world, we call it incarnation, have to do with our new birth, that is our regeneration, and to move toward an answer, I want to build a bridge between last week's sermon and this text. So here's my effort to build that bridge. The bridge consists in the amazing love of God. But I'll show you that in a minute. What we said last time was that when you ask why do you need to be born again, you can answer it in two senses. You can answer it by looking back and drawing attention to the terrible condition that we're in as dead and rebellious 
and unresponsive to spiritual reality and therefore you must be born again because you're in that bad spiritual condition. <clears throat> and, he said, and we said, you, you could also answer that question by looking to the future and observing from the Bible that there are things you won't experience in the future if you're not born again. And so you must be born again if you would experience and enjoy those future things. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. That's an answer to the second kind of why. Why do we need to be born again? Because there are things in the future we'd like to avoid and things in the future we would like to experience. And (coughs) new birth makes the difference whether you enjoy the positive ones and get rid of the negative ones. So that was the way we developed it last week. And we gave 10 answers to the first kind of why and five answers at the end to the second kind of why. And the bridge between that message, especially Ephesians 2, and this text in 1 John 3 is that phrase in verse 5 or 4, I think it is, being rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, while we were dead in trespasses and sins, he made us alive. Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So you hear the the focus in verse 4 of Ephesians 2 on because of the great love with which he loved us while we were dead, he made us alive. So he traces our new birth, our spiritual life, our quickening, our awakening from the dead, traces it back to the magnificence of the love of God. Now, read with me verses 1 and 2 of 1 John 3, and you will see exactly the same thing. See or behold what kind of love the Father has given to us. There's the link. He's saying, Wake up to this. This is amazing. That's the point of beginning with that little word, behold, or see. Because we don't, right? We read too fast. We take courses in how to read fast. It's crazy. We should take courses in how to read slow. Which is why learning Greek is a valuable thing. Main value makes you read slow. We don't see. And so sometimes authors have to say, see. So that's what he says. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. Now, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is because it didn't know him. Beloved. Loved ones, I just said you were big loved. So I'm calling you beloved, loved ones. We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. Now, I want to make four observations about those two verses to build this bridge between last time and this time, between the great love of God in Ephesians 2, 4, and the great love of God in 1 John 3, 1. Observation, four observations. Number one, when it says in verse 1 that we are called children of God, don't infer that to mean Well, we were children of God, but we weren't called it yet. And so he named us or something strange like that. The word called here doesn't carry that kind of meaning. Like we really were all along children of God. We just sort of called that. And so God comes along and creates names for us. Wrong. This 
This word called here, he called us children of God, means he made us children of God. He called us into being as children of God. And you can see that in the last phrase there. Called children of God, and so we are. Because he called us that. We are because he called us that. His call makes us children. This is new birth. So now we have the bridge, the link forged a little more clearly. There, he made us alive, was owing to magnificent love. And here, he called us to be children, made us to be children, gave us the life of the divine life in us. And that was owing to what great love he has. Observation number two. This new birth into the family of God is owing to the greatness of the love of God. I said it already, just making it a separate observation. Ephesians 2, 4. Because of the great love with which he loved us, he made us alive. Here, look what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. Made alive, born again, now children of God instead of dead and under his wrath. Number three, observation number three. This event of God's love moving into our lives and sovereignly calling us into being as children of God, that is, making us alive, raising us from the dead spiritually and causing the new birth, that event, according to this text, secures that we will one day be perfected into the likeness of Jesus. Let's see that here. Verse 2 connects the love of God and our present life as his children with the future like this. Beloved, those loved by God in this way. Beloved, we are God's children Now, you don't have to wait for this. You don't have to wait for the judgment day to see if you're a child of God, like some religions teach. We know we are children of God now. What we will be has not yet appeared. In other words, you don't look at anybody that looks like a child of God. We get sick. We die. We get upset with each other. Good night. There is nobody on the planet who looks very much like a child of God. And so we're incognito, walking around, dressing just like the world does, you know. Does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know. Now there's the phrase I'm going to underline. We know when he appears, we will be like him. Because we'll see him as he is. And evidently when you see him in the twinkling of an eye, replica. But now look at the logic here. We are God's children now. We don't yet see, hasn't appeared yet, the fullness of the beauty of what that's going to mean when the whole creation bows down to us. But we know. Now there's the link. Love of God, behold what kind, incomprehensible love of God coming to dead enemies quickens us and calls us into being His children so that we know we are the children of God, we are the children of God, and now we know something else about the future. Namely, when he comes, we're going to be like him. None of this question mark, oh, I wonder if we'll make it at the last day, I wonder if I'm in the 144,000 or something weird like that. We're going to make this thing because we know who we are right now. I'll come to that testimony business inside in, in a few minutes. So my third observation is this issue of what the new birth secures for us in the future, namely that we will be like him someday, was secured 
by the love of God, causing us to be born again, know we are now the children of God and that we will one day be like Him. This is all a golden chain of absolute rock-solid divine certitude worked for us and in us. Observation number four simply makes explicit, I think, what I've already drawn out. The new birth, therefore, is a necessary prerequisite and guarantee of the future perfection that we will have in the presence of Christ someday. Jesus said it this way, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. And I'm simply putting that in a positive way. Namely, if you are born again, you will see it. If you are born again, you'll see him when he appears. And in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, you will be changed. And this mortal will put on immortality. And this perishable will put on the imperishable. And we shall be changed and forever without sin and have glorified bodies perfectly suited to live with a glorified Savior. All of that follows from the new birth. And if you don't have the new birth, you may not get that. That is, you will not get that. So now the question I ask What's that got to do with Jesus' birth? What does the new birth and all of its effects have to do with Jesus being born? Being a man walking in history 2,000 years ago, he would have had a social security number if he were here today. Probably would have had an email account. Would have used the internet sparingly (laughs) with incredible care in order to remain sinless all his life. What's the relationship between that event, that historical incarnation of the eternal, divine Son of God, second person of the Trinity, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, We beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What's that got to do with my new birth? My being a child of God. My anticipating with great certainty that I'll see Him someday and be like Him. No more sin. Couldn't God simply have done the new birth without the incarnation? Just just cause sinners to be born again. Quicken them. Give them life. Help them battle sin. Shape them into better people. And when Jesus comes, do it totally. Forget this incarnation and all this bloody cross. What in the world? Why is the, Why is that part of the picture of the new birth thing. Did there need to be an incarnation of the Son of God, perfect obedience, death on a cross, in order for me to be born again? And the answer is the new birth and all of its effects, including faith, justification, purification, final conformity to Christ would have been impossible without the incarnation. Totally impossible without the incarnation. I want to spend the rest of this message on why that that is. And I hope you get a glimpse of your Savior so that during this final Advent days you will love Him more. Here's the first reason. The new birth, the aim of the new birth is first to awaken, quicken, produce, cause, create faith in Jesus Christ, 
the incarnate one. That's the aim of the new birth, to awaken faith in the incarnate Christ. And if the aim is impossible because there is no incarnate Christ, The new birth won't happen because that's the point of the new birth. God won't do the new birth because the new birth is aimed to open our eyes to see the glory of Christ crucified. And he can't be crucified if he's not a man. Look at 1 John 5, 1. Just a couple of chapters over. 1 John 5, 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ... That Jesus, Jesus, he didn't have that name before he was born. You shall call his name Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. He wasn't called Jesus in the Trinity. Everyone who believes that the incarnate historical Jewish teacher from Nazareth is the Christ, the Messiah, the divine Son of God... Everyone who believes that has been born of God. That's the point of the new birth. If you believe that, the new birth brought that about. Because that's the point of the new birth. To get attention for Jesus. To open your eyes to Jesus. If you're here tonight and Jesus means nothing to you, he's just kind of a boring historical figure alongside Mahatma Gandhi and and Muhammad and a few others, you're not born again. And the moment you become born again, he changes. He's everything to you. That's what has to happen. The Holy Spirit quickens your heart, opens the eyes that are blind right now, that are thinking the greatest person ever was is boring. That's blindness with a vengeance. And when the new birth happens, and may it happen as I speak, you will see him differently. So that's the point of the new birth in John First John 5, 1, everyone who believes has been born of God. That's what the new birth does. It enables you to believe like that. Here's reason number two for why the incarnation is necessary for the new birth. In causing us to be born again, do you remember several sermons ago, the way God the Spirit does it, is by bringing us into connection with Christ so that His life becomes our life. And the life we have as a newborn child isn't just life out of nowhere, it's life out of Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. When you touch Jesus like electric current, life happens and the new birth is the Spirit bringing us into union with Christ so that His life is our life. Now, that Christ to whom we are united is the incarnate Christ and no other. Listen to this word from John 6, 51. I am the living bread. This is Jesus talking now. He's got his hands out. I do believe he has his hands out. It doesn't say that. Just listen. I am the living bread that came down from from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give him for the life of the world is my flesh. Whoa. Not some kind of hokey pokey spiritualistic ethereal gas. Life comes through my flesh because it's my flesh that's getting nailed to a cross. Without that, there will be no life flowing from me to sinners. So when we're united to Christ and his life becomes ours, we're united to the God man. Not just some vague Christ figure out there. To the God man, Jesus Christ. Look at 1 John 5.10. I said I would, I would come back to the testimony for how we know that we're the children of God. We'll do a lot more on this in the weeks to come, but just glimpse here. 1 John 5.10. 
Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. What testimony? Verse um, verse 11. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. It's not dangling out there in la-la land. It's in his Son. Verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, and from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. That's where our life comes from. The Son, the Word made flesh is our life. This is the testimony. How do you know that you're a child of God. How do I know that John Piper is alive? Like, do you do this? It's my birth certificate. It's not, it's just a play birth certificate. It's my visa card, actually. It's my birth, birth certificate. Does anybody, does anybody believe you're alive because you have on file a birth certificate? You don't. It's because you breathe. It's exactly the same with Jesus Christ. You know that you're a child of God because you breathe. You're alive. You can't. Why would you? You're alive. You see him for who he is. You love him for who he is. You trust him for who he is. You embrace him for who he is. That's how you know you're alive. The testimony is within you. And what is it again? The testimony, verse 11. This is is the testimony. God gave us life. That's how you know you're alive to him, alive to God, and dying to sin. So the two reasons so far that the incarnation is necessary is number one, The aim of the new birth is to awaken faith in the crucified, incarnate Son of God. And if there were no incarnate, crucified Son of God, then the new birth would not be performed because the point of it would not be possible. Number two, the incarnation of the Son of God is necessary because the life that we have in the new birth in union with him is the life of the son of the incarnate Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I became the way by being man. Just a little comment here before I move on to the last part. This means that Christianity is not a kind of spirituality that floats in the air from religion to religion. There are so many people today trying to make a case that Christianity and other religions are one. They aren't. For a very simple reason. I'll read you three of them. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Muslims and Jews in particular reject the Son. Tragically. That ends it. It's over. All other talk is pointless. He who has the Son has life. Reject the Son, you reject Life. Number two, that's 1 John 5, 12. John 5, 23. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. If you say that the Son of God incarnate is a mere man, 
You dishonor the Son and thus dishonor the Father. Therefore, all talk of worshiping the true God is vain. All you do is dishonor the true God if you dishonor His Son. Number three, Luke 10, 16, Jesus said, the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. These are plain. There's no big theological argument here. These are plain statements from the Lord himself. If you reject me, you reject the Father. Therefore, all talk about us having the same God is ludicrous. And you got pastors in this city signing off on that. That's tragic. I come now to close with these last two things that I brought attention to last week. Justification and purification. Or if you want to use the old sanctification, you can. But purity is what's used in this text. I'm going to use it. Look at 1 John 3. We're back to our text now. 3 through 5. And everyone who thus hopes in him... In other words, if you're deeply confident that you're going to see him someday and become like him, that's what that's referring to. Verse 3, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins and in him there is no sin. Now, I want you to see in this text, purification explicitly, justification implicitly. Let's do purification first. John says, if you've experienced the new birth, and thus your heart has been awakened to hope in Jesus Christ, and you cannot wait until he appears because all your sin will be done away with, and you won't be battling with the internet anymore, you won't be battling with pride anymore, and you won't be battling with selfishness anymore, and you won't be battling with all the bitterness and anger in your life, you'll be free and like him if that's the passion of your life. This text says, you will purify yourself now. If you want it to happen in the future, you're just kidding yourself if you don't want it to happen now. Like, oh, he's going to show up someday and then I'll really want to be pure. You won't. I used to play those games when I was a kid. Get saved when I'm old. Because it's boring to be saved. So get saved when you're old. Won't happen. The hardness will creep over you and you will lose all your capacity. To know him, see him, love him. And God will withdraw from you. And you will perish thinking that on your deathbed you could repent. And you'll be an Esau. Pleading for repentance and it will not be given. Don't play that game. If you're 30 years old, don't play it. If you're 40, don't play it. 50, don't play it. And sure don't play it. If you're 6, don't play that game. We will purify ourselves, meaning we're going to fight, right? We're going to fight. Nobody in this room is perfect. Nobody will be pure perfectly before you die. The question is, who's fighting? Who's fighting? Who says, yes, I want him to come. Yes, I'd like to be like him perfectly. It grieves me not to be more like him than I am. Now I'm going to fight this thing. Who's that? That's the children of God talking. I don't care how many times you fall down. If you get up talking like that, you're a child of God. Purification follows from the new birth. Get love of God. Calls us to be a child of God. New life flows into us confident that we will one day be like him and then the logic of verse 3 those who thus hope in him purify themselves as he is pure that follows from the love of God and the new birth and therefore if there can't be an incarnation I mean if there can't be regeneration without an incarnation then there won't be any purification without an incarnation either everything hangs on the incarnation. Lastly, 
justification. It's not mentioned here. It's not mentioned at all in 1 John directly. But I want you to look at something and see if you puzzle what I puzzle. This is 1 John 3. What's going on in verses 4 and 5? Out of the blue. Is it out of the blue? Why are you saying this? Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Well, what's the point of that? What are you bringing up lawlessness for? It's not even used anywhere else in the book. Out of the blue. He says, if you practice sin, you practice lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. And you know that he appeared to take away sins. What's the point? Here's my effort to see this. He wants to make clear that the great work of Christ in saving us from sin, verse 5, he appeared to take away sin. The great work of Christ in taking away sin does not merely involve purification Because there's a law involved. You don't get dirty when you break a law. You get guilty when you break a law. Your danger is not being defiled when you break a law. Your danger is going to jail when you break a law. Your danger is the judge, not the bathtub or whatever... You see what he's doing? He's saying, all sin, of course you're impure, and a holy God can't have you there without purification, and hence new birth, and transformation, and final glorification, and likeness to Jesus. All that is absolutely necessary if we're going to be with him forever in joy. But now he's saying, and don't forget this, all sin is law-breaking which means you've got another problem on your hand. Guilt. You've got another problem on your hand. Wrath from a holy lawgiver. What you going to do about that? New birth? That won't do any good. New birth won't solve your guilt problem. Being made like him at the end won't solve your guilt problem. You're as guilty as ever when you become like Jesus. Years and years and years of God demeaning sin undealt with if all you got is new birth. Well, you know the answer to that. And so does John. Let me give you two verses where he tips his hand as to how he sees this. This is 1 John 4.10. In this is love, not that we loved God, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Whoa. Big word, propitiation. What's that? Removal of the indignation and judgment and wrath of God. He sent his son to remove the consequence of our guilt. Propitiation, wrath absorbed by Jesus for you. Couldn't have happened without the incarnation. He has a body. He goes to the body, with the body to the cross. And God Almighty says, I love the people that I'm going to make alive and I'm going to remove all wrath from them and pour it out on my son. If you don't love Jesus for that, you're blind. Oh, how precious. It's not about trees. It's not about lights. It's not about stars. It's not about presents. It's about that amazing substitution. And the other verse is 1 John 2, 1. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 
But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Why do you think he says the righteous? You can see where I'm going. I think this is John's statement about justification. I got guilt. I got wrath. I've got the shortcomings of no righteousness, no perfection. I got nothing going for me. And Jesus Christ, because of the love of God, is sent into the world and he provides the righteousness I don't have and he absorbs the guilt and the wrath that I don't want and he enables the Holy Spirit then to move on me and open my eyes to see that and be saved by believing it. So I conclude... Um, without the incarnation without Christmas nothing is possible but hell the new birth isn't possible faith isn't possible purification isn't possible justification isn't possible And my final glorification, being like him, isn't possible. Christmas is important. But for all the reasons that the world doesn't know much about, what a glorious holiday. It's worth a few lights. It's worth a lot of family love. It's worth a lot of gifts. It's make it good. Make it good. But get this. Get this. And love him. Love him. Love him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we believe that you are here in this room by your spirit listening to me make much of you. And I believe that you're pleased with what we've sung and prayed and preached. And we just want to say out loud that we love you and that this holiday over the next couple of days is about you. And we want to ask for forgiveness for if we've gotten anything lopsided here and that you would draw near to the families of our church and the single people of our church and the young and the old of our church and the lonely and the surrounded of our church and make yourself centrally precious, the treasure that you are. We ask this so that you would be glorified in everything we experience in these days. Amen.